I'm James McGuire. I'm a family law attorney at the law firm of Hillis, Clark, Martin, and Peterson. I want to welcome all of you to uh, tonight. And um, uh, before I engage in a longer introduction, I wanted to, first of all, thank um, all the wonderful sponsors of this event. Um, first of all, the ACLU, um, GSBA, which is the Greater Seattle Business Association, Legal Voice, Pride Foundation, the Q Law Foundation, um, Lambda Legal, and the UW School of Law that's provided the wonderful facility for us tonight, specifically the graduate program in taxation and the tax clinic. I also want to uh, shout out to Allison Warden, who's a student in the LLM program, and Professor John Clinch of the tax clinic. Um, as I said, I'm James McGuire. I'm a family law attorney at Hillis Clark. I'm the moderator tonight, um, and my practice is mostly in litigation. I do both high asset and mid asset cases, parenting plans, custody, assisted reproductive technology, mediation, and collaborative law. And I have people sitting next to me who I um, can tell you right now are experts in their field and know a lot of wonderful um, bits of information that I hope we're going to discuss tonight. Um, to my immediate right is Wendy Goff, who is uh, a very well-known estate planner at the law firm of Stoll Reeves. Wendy has been in the uh, estate planning field her entire career, mostly, mm -hmm. and um, has been a long uh, time uh, participant and advocate in the LGBT estate planning area. She's one of the big experts. I've seen her speak several times. Um, she has a permanent byline um, uh, in Forbes magazine where she writes about estate planning issues. And shoes. And shoes. And, um, <laughs> and uh, she's going to be talking to us about uh, some of the, um, the DOMA case, the Prop 8 case, possibly some estate planning issues and, and how this all relates to tax. Um, next to Wendy is Marcy Flannery, who is a well-known CPA here in um, Seattle. And Marcy has most recently become known about uh, with her work in income splitting. Um, Marcy became a CPA in 1984, and she worked in for Arthur Anderson. She's taught accounting at the University of Kansas. Um, she also has her PhD in cognitive psychology, um, and she has written a guide to uh, registered domestic partnership taxation, and she teaches uh, to CPAs in both Washington and California. I might point out also that several of us provided um, materials here that you can review um, after the presentation, including stuff from my firm, this wonderful um, free publication that Marcy authored and things from Landa and Legal Voice and so on. I also want to do a shout out to two other people, Jill Mullins of the law firm of McKinley Urban, who did a lot of work. Um, Jill has been involved and a, a wonderful advocate for LGBT people here um, on the Q Law Foundation board with me and was the person really behind the, the mo did most of the work behind starting the Q Law Foundation um, clinic that um, sees individuals legal advice, um, and also David Ward here, sitting right here, who is, works for Legal Voice, so those two are um, involved in our, um, getting our presentation together. All right. So why, why tax issues with regard to DOMA and marriage equality? Well, as you know, we're in the wonderful state of Washington, which appears to be the most liberal state in the nation, um, thank God, and um, now we have Ref 74, and um, we don't really know the impact of all of that. We've got these cases that are before SCOTUS right now. Um, and whether you're an attorney or an interested person in the public or a uh, student in the tax clinic, um, these issues are going to come up, and I think they're well worth discussing. So I think we're just going to kind of do a free form here. Marcy and uh, Wendy are, are both very experienced presenters. And um, I'm going to start with Wendy kind of talking about those two cases regarding DOMA and Prop 8 that are currently before the Supreme Court. And uh, Thank you. It's nice to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, I wanted, unless you've been under a rock for the last two days or you're a CPA and have been <laughs> preparing returns, um, you, you probably know that in the last two days there were two same-sex marriage cases. On Tuesday was the Prop 8 case, 
Collinsworth v. Perry, which is a California case of state law. And then on Wednesday was the Windsor case, and that's a case that came out of the Second Circuit um, and is, is a federal law DOMA case. Um, Prop 8 has to do with the fact that uh, same-sex marriage was found to be constitutional in an earlier version of the Hollingsworth case, I guess it was the Schwarzenegger case, and um, so it's brought against the, the governor, so it, it, the name keeps changing. Um, marriage was found constitutional, and then marriage was found, it was overturned during the period that marriages were allowed. There were 18,000 married couples in California. Those marriages are still considered valid, but anyone married after that who's like marriages at from 4:45 in the afternoon on the day that the statute became valid until midnight of the last day that it was valid, or, or the ability to marry. It was it was found um, marriages were stayed pending resolution of all of the court cases. Prop 8 overturned the ability to get married and made marriage unconstitutional. Prop 8, that, uh, the challenge of Prop 8 was taken to the Supreme Court, and there are a couple issues. One is standing, and uh, standing, for those of you who aren't lawyers, is um, did the people who brought the case have the right to bring the case? Because it was originally a uh, case against the governor, and the current governor refused to be a party to the case, so other people came in, in in the governor's shoes and brought the case, and the argument that the proponents of this case don't have standing is kind of a red herring, because if you, if nobody has, you have, somebody has to have standing, and I think if you listen to the the five minutes of the argument on Tuesday about standing, it was really interesting how they parsed that out. And if it was, if this was some other case that didn't have to do with same-sex marriage, would be, be even discussing standing was one of the questions. Um, so I think it's, that standing is going to be a red herring that they're going to determine that somebody had to step into the shoes of, of the people to face. And um, it, it's my thought that they wouldn't have even brought, they wouldn't have accepted the case for review as they thought that the proponent. So there are a couple different ways they can rule. They can uphold Proposition 8. In that case, the states would be free to allow or ban same-sex marriage state law case. So remember, it only really has effect within the state of California unless the court decides to get really creative um, because it, it deals with state law. So they could uphold Prop 8 and that would leave the status quo. They could strike, strike down Prop 8 on the grounds that all bans on same-sex marriage violate the Constitution be pretty broad since this is a California Constitution case. Um, so for them to step out on a limb and say that it, it violates the U.S. Constitution, you know, if, if Ted Olson, if anybody can do it, Ted Olson can do it, but we'll, we'll see. And the result of that would be that um, the states that have bans on same-sex marriage, those would be unconstitutional. So it doesn't mean that states have to allow marriages, but those state-specific bans would be unclear. Um, second way that uh, this could go is they strike down Prop 8 on the grounds that California was not free to provide same-sex couples with all the benefits and burdens of marriage through civil unions, but withhold the designation of marriage. So under this rationale, which was suggested in the Obama administration's brief. Bans on same-sex marriage in the eight states with everything but marriage civil unions are unconstitutional. So a, a more limited ruling, and um, so that would affect eight states. I think, um, 
not DC because they have merit now. Um, the next thing that they could do is uh, strike down Prop 8 on the basis that Prop 8 was, uh, that California was not entitled to withdraw a right to same-sex couples once it had given that right. So under this rationale, uh, San Francisco, uh, um, when San Francisco struck down Prop 8, California would allow same-sex marriage, but bans in other states would apply. Um, that's my guess is that where they're going to go unless they get really creative in a much broader argument. And I'd be interested too, David. Do you have any questions? Sorry. Yeah, we didn't we didn't tell you that we were going to pick a spot, but not out of California. Well, so the other thing they could do is decide that the supporters of Prop 8 lack standing to appeal. And in that case, um, the, there are a couple different things that can happen, but um, some say that the trial court's decision would survive and that either is a consequence of the decision actions of the state officials. Um, and in that, in that scenario, in either of those scenarios, um, that uh, that would just affect California, public California schools. So it's kind of an odd case that they even took it, and I I don't understand why. And I actually think that they could come out in um, where there's no marriage in California, but a full Windsor possible. Weird. I don't know why they would have taken. I don't know why they took a state. So the next case is the Windsor case, and that's a federal case, federal DOMA. And the federal DOMA is the law that says that a state doesn't have to respect a same-sex marriage if it violates the laws of that state. So if um, we, uh, up until November, our Constitution, well, our, our Washington law said that um, marriage between couples wouldn't be recognized and so we didn't have to recognize out-of-state marriages. And that's permitted by DOMA. Uh, typically, the rules of comedy, which is a, is a C-O-M-I-T-Y, not comedy, like, uh, um, say that one state has to recognize the laws of another state. And the Defense of Marriage Act, the Federal Defense of Marriage Act, is an end run on that. It says, no, you don't have to recognize the laws of another state if you don't in your own state. That was passed in 1996. Washington actually uh, um, adopted uh, its own mini-DOMA, which is what they call the State Defense of Marriage Acts, in 1999. So that case had to do with the marital deduction, whether or not a surviving spouse uh, was allowed to inherit her, part, her spouse's estate tax-free, whereas a heterosexual married couple is allowed to transfer assets between them tax-free at death, and she had to pay a $300,000 estate tax bill, and she challenged it. Um, the Second Circuit found that DOMA was unconstitutional and that she should be allowed the marital deduction. The curious thing about that case to me is that um, in constitutional law, they can issue opinions that are um, as applied rulings, meaning the ruling only applies to the parties in question and not to anybody else. And in the Second Circuit, it was an as applied ruling. And then it was appealed to the US Supreme Court and presumably they can issue a broader ruling. And I, I don't get that, how they can go out on a limb again and broader. But here's how the court could rule there. They could say the 1996 law is unconstitutional. DOMA is unconstitutional, and therefore same-sex couples in the nine states that allow marriage in D.C. Um, would be subject to, the, to federal law. They, they would be recognized by federal law as married. 
Alternatively, they could say DOMA is constitutional, current law is unchanged, married opposite sex couples continue, continue to receive federal benefits, and married same sex couples continue to be denied them, except to the extent that they're recognized for limited purposes under income. Um, and then again, they could say we're powerless to decide that the parties lack standing and um, uh, that the law is unconstitutional and the House Republicans don't have standing to defend it. And in that case, Edith Windsor wins her case and becomes entitled to a tax refund of $300,000. Um, but there would be no broader effect. It would just apply to her. Again, not sure why they'd take the case if it only applied. Now, the interesting thing, I think, if you've been listening to the radio, um, we all have ideas about how judges rule in Supreme Court cases. Um, the one judge who's the wild card is Justice Kennedy, because Justice Kennedy, he kind of plays both sides of the aisle. He's both, uh, he, he supports personal rights and sexual freedom, but he also supports states' rights. So one might assume up until not that long ago that he would have supported the repeal of DOMA um, based on prior history in other sexual freedoms cases, uh, Lawrence v. Texas, for example. Uh, on the other hand, he is a supporter of states' rights, and he's basically said in, in a number of cases, most recently the um, Arizona immigration case where pretty much the entire court, well, the liberal members of the court said this is appalling, but the states have the right to uh, legislate within their own boundaries, and this, we're going to let this let, uh, immigration legislation stand, and he was with the majority on that and said it's it's appalling legislation, but this is what they're they have a right to do that. So it's very likely in the Prop 8 case he would say Californians have the right to do what Californians want to do, and it's none of our business to mix in. But in the DOMA case, he 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 would. Um, be more liberal in applying the, the Constitution and defending personal rights is, is my guess, I think, from reading the tea leaves, that's what I'm picking up. Um, and from listening to the arguments, or the snippets, it seems to be where we're going. Just setting up on that. I haven't had time to read the arguments with David. Seems like it's going to be struck down in some fashion. The one prediction, you know, people have made all sorts of predictions, and I'll, I'll say, you know, they predicted Clarence Thomas would not ask a question, and he came through for us. So, you know, so far, <laughs> we're batting a thousand on those predictions. No, Massachusetts was merged with Gill. And the problem with Gill is that Sotomayor was involved in it at a lower level, and she would have to recuse herself, and then we'd have 4-4 four, four split in the court. So nobody wanted Gill to be one of the cases. Oh, nice. So. <laughs> I think it's a good point. Um, Marcy, why don't you uh, My practice, as I said, I do uh, you know, tax issues sometimes. And as a family law attorney, I have to wear a lot of hats uh, as an advocate. 
come out that I don't want to wear a life and hold her therapist, which I'm clergy. Clergy, yes. Um, but one of the big disclaimers I am constantly saying to my clients all throughout a case is I am not a tax professional. Um, and I have to know some things about tax, and, and uh, the, the rules are, uh, I mean, it depends on how much you like reading those kinds of regulations and so on, um, but it can be a, a minefield. And so because of that, we have people like Marcy Flannery here, who's very qualified, and who I, people like her I consult with regularly about tax issues or have my, my clients consult with, uh, regularly on their, their uh, tax issues related to the end of a relationship. So, Marcy, why don't you give us a, um, since I'm just becoming acquainted with um, Publication 555, the private letter ruling that came out in 2010, Q&As, maybe you can start with telling the audience a little bit of history about okay. how that's developed. Yeah. So, let me back up. One of the first, um, so one of the first things that usually happens when I have a client come into my office is usually actually be even worse. They can actually come in to me because I work with same-sex couples, and they'll say, "Yeah, we want you to do our work," and then I find out that they have absolutely no clue that a thing called income splitting. So we always have to back up, and I, I talk about it. But one of the things I like to do is explain the history. Because where this comes from is actually an opposite sex married couple case in Washington. And uh, what happened in this office, back in the 1930s, you didn't have married filing joint. And so this opposite sex couple, you know, husband made a lot of money, wife made nothing, stayed at home. Normally, the wife wouldn't file a tax return and the husband. Born case which is that actually this is very exciting for tax accounts because it's a different case. Uh, basically, the husband came forward and said, we live in a community property state. Uh, therefore, my wife, we have to report half my income. And, because of and so uh, this, the IRS uh, fought them all the way to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court came out with uh, They're correct. They live in a community property state. Half of the income earned by wife, and so they filed two tax returns. They reported. Okay, 1950s come along, World War II, and they brought married filing joint into the tax. <coughs> right, and so all of a sudden, even though this community property law still exists and it still it still has effects for opposite sex couples, it, opposite sex couples just kind of became blind to it. Right, because everything was being reported on. And so we go forward a few more years, and California there is a couple of guys, uh, I can't remember if they're living in Los Angeles or San Francisco. But anyway, so opposite sex couple, or I'm sorry, same sex couple, one makes quite a bit of money around eight hundred the other stays home, takes care of the house, and they go, you know live in a community property state. And so half of what I earn actually belongs to So we really should be filing uh, tax returns where we split our income. And in 2006, uh, they got a private letter ruling on this where the IRS said, no, you can't do that. Based on code. Yeah, and so they went back to him and said, really? You're saying we live in a state, community property rights, are extended to us. California did extend community property rights to them. And you're telling us that we can't split our income? And the IRS came back in 2010 with a ruling in May of 2010 and said, oh, by the way, you're right, never mind. <laughs> Based on Poe versus Seaborn. Right, Based exactly. on Poe versus Seaborn. Uh, yeah. Oh, okay, so it's, it's kind of similar to what you were talking about. In a private letter ruling, you can go to the IRS, if you, uh, Treasury, and if you have an issue and you cannot find a clear answer on it, you're worried about, uh, you think you have a clear answer on it, but you want the IRS to say, yes, you can file your tax return that way. File for a private letter ruling, and they will um, 
Becky and say, yeah. and based on that private letter ruling, later on they can't audit me with can hit me with No, no, private letter rulings have no, they don't apply to anybody but the person who applied for it, and that's why the IRS came out and did a CCA, which is chief counsel, and said, oh, we've got this private letter ruling, well, they don't say it exactly. Private letter ruling came out, they said, this is actually how the tax law should be applied, so we're going to come out and tell everybody that not only does it apply to these guys, it applies to everybody in this situation. At Washington, this community property state where there are registered domestic partners. And in 2008, Washington, even though they had RDPs before June of 2008, to extend community property rights, so people in Washington, California, Nevada, Those three states, recognize same-sex uh, registered domestic partners or something like that, and they extend community property. So in those three states, if you fall under that, are supposed to be fine under that. Okay, actually, when you know when we took tax procedure, not in this building, but here. Um, the CCA has less authority than a private letter ruling, so it's sort of a guide. It's sort of like the instructions, publication 555, which also says shall split income. Um, private letter ruling in the CCA. And so there are people who are still taking the position that they don't have to. And I was looking for the name of the guy because I was on a panel in Denver and Steve Toomey is the head of the division that issued these and I said, um, why haven't you repealed the 1996 private letter ruling that says based on Poe versus Seaborn, that applied to a heterosexual couple, you can't split it. And he said, well, we don't have to because we have a later ruling that says you can, and I, and I said, and it's a private letter ruling, it's not a revenue ruling, and what, what kind of authority does it really have? And he said, it's indicative of this administration. So maybe we can ask Professor Clint or one of the tax students, maybe, how does that turn into an internal revenue code? Different things that we've talked about, the private letter ruling. This um, publication 555, does that mean there's just a publication and there's no regulation on it or some part of the code? Or? No, publication actually, if you make a mis if you rely on the publication and the publication is wrong, that's not a defense that you rely on the publication. Like saying TurboTax made a mistake. And, and that actually leads to one of the biggest. Of 555, the IRS basically says, they have a problem with this, that there's purposes of self-employment tax. So let's say I have a business and for income tax, I, ha I split that income 50-50. The IRS says that for self-employment tax, you also split that income 50-50. Way you do it for opposite sex married couples if they were in an income splitting situation. They can do married filing separately, so there is that situation. They split the income 50 50 for income tax purposes, but for self employment tax purposes, there is that. Got two partners, let's say one has $100,000 of wages, one has $100,000. They're an opposite sex couple, they're both getting basically $100,000. Same sex. First who earns wages is going to get credit for 150 
150,000. The person who's self-employed is only going to get. They actually get to retirement age. That matters because if the goes away, uh, you can't collect them. A really important reason why don't. Why don't we talk about, it's a good question, yeah. and, and why don't we talk question. about the basic mechanics of income splitting? Yeah. So okay. under income splitting, and I'm sorry, Wendy, no, go that's more it. about this than I do. Yeah. Under income splitting, uh, what you basically have to do is you have to look at every item reported on your tax. And you have to determine whether, first for the income, whether that income is community whether it's separate property income. And by definition, for instance, if you're earning wages, wages are defined as community property income. So you would take the wages and you'd split them. 50% goes on this return, 50% goes on. Now, if you, let's say, one of the partners has received a big inheritance, Uh, inheritance is separate property, and so the income earned on that inheritance would only go on one partner's It doesn't get split between them. You have to go down the tax return line by line, and line, so you can have investment income from community property and investment income. Both partners could have separate. You have to identify every item, determine whether it's community or separate, and then split it or don't split it according to so, very. It sounds very easy, but, but it's hard when you've got couples who've been together for. Start asking them, well, is this separate property? Is this community property? They don't know because it's been hopelessly commingled. Actions. Lots of times you'll find out they're very tied to what they've been doing in the past. So they'll say, well, I always, you know, I always deduct the mortgage. Wages. You know, you might have one who's the higher earner and they pay the mortgage. And so they think, I get all the mortgage deductions even though, but really, if you think about it, you're paying the mortgage out of something that's community. So, absent some, you know, there are some ways to get around this, but absent doing anything, that mortgage interest really should be split between the two tax If it was separate property, you can do the trace. Go over on one return. It, it, on the deduction side, it hurts you because about five, six thousand dollars extra deductions that way. So if you if you don't have to aggregate the income then you some of the deductions you take a haircut if you own if you make more income and so you lose the ability the inequity i see is i work with a lot of high net worth couples but their high net worth because one person is an executive making a million dollars a year um and the other one is a nurse at home parent and not making very much money in that case, it's a great level, it levels the playing field because they've come to me to move income from one, or move assets from one partner to the other partner, and all they have to do is put $500,000 of their income in their partner's name and they pay income tax on it. Great solution. But what do you do about the person who has a $20 million trust fund and investment income, and it's all separate property, and they're now, Washington's spouse makes $30,000 a year as a nurse and is held on to that job because they want to be able to pay into Social Security and continue to pay into a 401k because of the inequity in the system. Well, then this system makes things even more inequitable because the wealthier one who's making a lot of money as um, separate property off of their investments 
uh, doesn't have to share any of that because it's not earned income. But the nurse who's making twenty or thirty thousand dollars now has to put half of that into the bank account of their spouse um, as community property. So sometimes it can be a terrible, terrible situation. If they had a prenuptial agreement, it would probably be found to be an equitable prenuptial agreement. What exactly? If one had seven, you know, twenty million dollars in separate property and the other one had uh, made thirty thousand dollars in community. That's on the terms of the, the court kind of frowns on. I'm going to actually get to pre prenups and when I was Go reviewing Marcy, not now, but when I was reading Marcy's material, um, there was some stuff about ways to out of mm -hmm. income splitting. But you, you have to do income splitting in the Unless you opt out. Unless you opt out. And can you explain maybe to the audience how you can opt out? Uh, and and I, as I was reading some of your materials, uh, Marcy, um, it doesn't always make sense to do income split. Sometimes it's not going to be kind of the wrinkles that, and I know it's kind of hard right. to, to have us add up things without it <laughs> on the chalkboard, but. When it's, there, there's a, the perfect example when it's good to income split is when you, in that case, if you income split, 20 or more thousand, or between 20 and 26, per because, year. Because you're riding up the brackets. Because of the marginal tax rates. And then, Sometimes it, you know, it can get. So you can get I, the most I've seen in one year. I think. So um, that's where it's really good when you've got a big disparity in income. Where it is horrible is where you've got uh, where one has retired and collecting social security. Social Security, generally, if all you're earning is Social Security, that's generally going to be tax-free. Security, and until you have uh, just a gross income of like dollars you just don't get to where it's taxed. But if you take the same situation where one person's earning Social Security and their partner is making $1,000 a year, up their adjusted gross income and all of a sudden there's a horrible situation as you know where I see it saving money is with people who I earn this already and so you're always going great <laughs> I really you know income split then you have a couple come in where one's your tax is going up by eight hundred dollars and you think, well, it's eight hundred dollars, but eight hundred dollars is a lot of money if you're only. So it's a really sad, and I just hate seeing it. I it just. They're penalizing them for by auditors who don't. Uh, and I haven't actually. I'm trying to think. I don't think they're looking for it. Um, but definitely, they they will audit people that are doing income splitting, and sometimes it's based on pure ignorance of the person. The audit. They they pull this audit. Well, in the early days, three years ago, right, people were sending in their properly prepared tax returns and 
having them sometimes just trashed and not being told that they were being or they were being sent back and told that they were filing fraudulent returns. Some CPAs were attaching the CCA. That has really gone away because most of the, all of those returns are filed in Fresno now. Fresno, I believe, has a basically a processing unit. Kind of beneficial, but they all kind of go through the same. I haven't, and I haven't had any guidance at all. But I'm really clear about what I'm doing. I mean, it, they, my returns all are paper filed, and they all have a cover sheet on it saying why I'm filing and and, and you know, I'm, I'm sure there are people out there who are saying, well, I, who are saying that with the seat. There are so few, the thing is, there are so few people in the IRS who even, but. And there's nothing in the return to, to indicate yeah, that you're in a domestic in a, partnership. Yeah, they're not, they're not looking it up. And, and your, but, when I read your materials, Marcy, you had the IRS method and then you had the alternative. Self-employment tax. Yeah. Okay. So can, can you explain that a little bit? Well, their guidance in, their guidance for self-employment tax is in Cup 555. Which just means it's guidance. And so uh, because I disagree with it, and I what they're doing—they're making you split the self-employment tax, right? And it's based on Treasury regulation, where they happen to use the word tax. And if whoever came out with this decision that you have to split it, it basically says, oh, in the case of a spouse where it's community property, you don't have to split it, and it goes on. And if you read it, it really is just this clarifying, it's, they're just clarifying what you would do in the case of a community house. Someone said, oh, so it only applies for considered married under federal law, so it must not apply. I and pretty much any CPA I've ever talked to about just thinks, this. So, um, we don't have to follow that. It's not substantial. So I discuss it with my client. Um, in some cases, the splits can save you like $6,000 because if you've got somebody who's already earning like the limit on wages and they're, uh, And they're saying earning the limit in self-employment. Half of their self-employment income, or calculating self-employment tax, they're only going to pay the Medicare. So you can save on half the income, you can save about six. Months. I want to do that, even though I warn them. That Terms for tier rather having six thousand dollars. Maybe. <laughs> you know, I mean, I think I think we all think it will, but we don't know what they're going to say. Doma goes away. I mean, if Doma goes away, which basically. Lambda legal, my understanding is Lambda legal. For instance, in um, California, though, they, they just have 30 fees and the 18,000 married people, right? But the 18,000 married couples, but for the RDPs, I believe Lambda legal. Although, I don't want to put words in Lambda Eagles now. That was a couple of months ago, I thought. Well-known professor in California. She and her partner got married as soon as marriage was legal. Yeah. Oh, and that's the litigation. Here's the ABA Tax Faculty Committee advises the IRS. And she believes that 
based on Poe v. Seaborn, can file a joint return, and they do, and she's very open about it, that Poe v. Seaborn is definitive authority. The 1996 PLR is background noise. The 2000 PLR is background noise. They're just going to file a joint return. And there's nothing on the return that would cause you to know. Box that you filed. Questions? And if you're a high income earner and it's a substantial understatement, there's a six year. Although then what happens is one of you files for a refund and um, the other one files earning, owing more money, and you, you will likely get slapped with interest and a penalty for your substantial understatement. And the Internal Revenue Manual, uh, it's the funniest part of the Internal Revenue Manual, says you can't waive the interest, but, so that's something to think about is you have to pay the interest, but you shall for one time, waive the penalty, and say you're sorry. It actually it, says that? It mm -hmm. does. Um, if you're worried about the interest rates, or interest rates. And the person who's getting a refund gets. But sometimes if you if a lot of money is involved, you yeah. have to wait for the refund to come before you can pay. And taxpayers don't know that they can get the penalty waived. The IRS assesses the penalty, and they don't know that the IRS is supposed to waive it and say they're sorry. So um, why don't we talk for a second about ignoring If, if well, you wanted to. Unfortunately, if, if a couple comes to me and they tell me, I make them income split. But they certainly have the right to walk out the door. Oh, if they, yeah. So if they had a, po a post-nuptial agreement, I'll happy. And I, you know, because I've heard of, of that approach to do it, and, you know, Bob and I had a prenup just in the last year. I was like, that was fun. Um, and we're in a state that has a very, very strong prison. In any agreement, I don't know if Wendy would agree with me, but any agreement that I would draft on a prenup that says everything that we have is our separate property um, is probably not going to be looked at. Every, everything we earn during the marriage is separate property. In other words, as lawyers on opposite ends of a prenup, if you're smart, you're going to be creating some community 
because that's what the courts like in terms of the substantive portions of the agreement. So if you had an agreement as a way to avoid income splitting that just disclaimed any, I mean, I wonder if that's a problem. You know, from a perspective, if I think if somebody, an IRS agent came in and was like, I think as long as we have the document, parties are following the document, which is, I've heard stories of couples who were like, they have the prenup, but that's only just for taxes. Well, that doesn't work. You can't get a prenup and then come in with everything. So I think as long as they're following the prenup, I don't think there'd be a problem with that. There may be a problem when they divorce. Could be. Yeah. And enforceability of the agreement. Because, yeah, because no community. But using it during their relationship to file taxes, I think you can do that. Yeah. It's kind of scary to file these returns because you file them with the federal government, and they're basically saying this property is community. We're agreeing that this property is community and this property is community. And we've only been doing this for two or three years. Lawsuits haven't started yet. But I think they'll be out there, you know. Well, that was just for our tax return. I didn't look at my tax return. I just... Days have been very careful to actually, or I am anyway, and I know. Try to get clients to go through the list of assets. I think the lawsuits will start coming. The divorce cases. I had a question in terms of tax filings. Is it a wonderful tax season? File an extension to a complaint. About DOMA? It depends on your situation. You don't have to. Well, first of all, let me say, most of my clients, their taxes will go up if DOMA goes away. Because married filing joint, at the marriage penalty, most of them are going to be subject to it. Taxes will actually go up when... So I'm telling my clients to file before the DOMA decision comes out. Get the benefit of lower taxes. If you have a client that files, and they would actually pay less under married filing joint, then I'm guessing they should be able to amend. If you think you're going to file less, then you probably want to do two things. One, extend October 15th only so you're extending your statute of limitations another six months. And then file a protective return. Talk about the protective return. No. So protective return, and this is a good thing to do for prior years. And I think where we'll be seeing lots of protective returns are for people... ...that you can file with the IRS a protective return. I cannot remember the number. There are two ways to do it. You can file an actual protective claim saying, I want to go back and file my return as married filing joint if DOMA goes away. That keeps your statute open for more than three years. Or you can amend your tax return for that year, and they'll reject it, but you have the right then to... January 1st, 2014. 
But if you're married in Washington and you don't, or if you're a domestic partner in Washington and you don't have a marriage prior to January 1st, 2014, it would be automatic. On January 1st, 2014. June 30th. Oh, that's right. That's, that's correct, yeah. So that those kind of prior years are grandfathered in, essentially. I was, when I was reading that, I was wondering what effect that would have. As a divorce attorney, Jill, maybe you can say, um, and I had this in an RDB case now that I, parties are divorcing. Normally in uh, just regular opposite sex marriage, when people have a, whether they're not in domestic partners, but they're in a committed into a relationship, Courts and the attorneys will try to uh, tack on, essentially, let's say, 10 years of um, getting into a relationship and then 10 years of marriage. Well, it's really a 20-year relationship. The question becomes, for a maintenance calculation, is it a 20-year marriage or is it a 10-year marriage? Because that's the biggest factor in whether or not the court's going to award spousal support or as we state of Washington. One of the biggest factors is the length of the marriage. Um, and I think it's an interesting question, but as this gentleman points out, you know, you kind of grandfather these years in, and now since 2008, under our domestic partnership law, you can get maintenance and all those things that you couldn't get in divorce court before. So the last iteration of domestic partnership law, you can, the court can consider separate property, you can get attorneys. Um, so I'm not so sure it really has an effect, except to say that it is recognizing those years as marriage. Well, let's even say that those prior years were committed into a relationship, and let's not even say opposite sex or same sex. It's interesting, again, to me, because for the maintenance analysis, kind of one thing, but absolutely the courts will say, that's pseudo-community property, and we divide it as community property. So uh, there's kind of a disconnect there with those two issues that you might be involved in. No, no one would ever do that. <laughs> no, I think that's that's a good that's a good analysis that might. Yeah. Well, um, I think that we could maybe talk about some more um, issues that might come up with income s splitting. Um, can you talk a little bit, Marcy, about uh, one thing that I was interested in when I was reading your materials is about um, how income splitting either under all the and I don't know if I understand this correctly either under the IRS method or the alternative method could affect the Social Security earnings. And it, it, it might sound great to people, oh, we can income split, we can save $3,000 in taxes or something, but it might really screw you over on your bank and Social Security. And, um, yeah, I I'm sorry, I have to talk with my hands. 
Tax returns are going here. Um, for wages, if you're a wage earner, income splitting has absolutely no effect on it. Whether you were income splitting or not, if you're a wage earner, you are getting full credit for all your wages. The problem with income splitting is for the self-employed person. So this self-employed person, so the IRS method, half of their income is credited to the wage earner. They don't get half of the wage earners given to them for Social Security. So really, it's the self-employed person that really can as far as their retirement. And again, to, to go forward, you, you might say, well, short-term savings, you know, access by doing this. Problem is, you go forward 20 years and all about half the Social Security benefits. The self-employed person could have half the Social Security benefits. First, if they split up, they're not going to have their higher earning wage earner, uh, higher Social Security benefits, help support them. Fiber benefits for same sex. It's, it's very, it's weird, because if, so what you're, you're talking about, income splitting, if you have, let's say one makes um, 100000 and one makes 50000 So for income tax purposes, they're each going to report $75,000 on their tax. 75000 on each tax. Social security purposes, The person who makes $100,000, they're going to get $100,000 credited credit in the social security. They're going to get $50,000 credit in the social security. Um, Marcy or Wendy, can you talk a little bit about maybe thoughts, if any, on There's a problem under federal law that if you are converting your already community property into separate property, you're making a gift. So it, there are um, conflicting obligations because under state law you have a legal obligation to support your partner. But some people believe that there, if you are supporting your partner by spending more than $13,000 or $14,000 per year on your partner, $14,000 being the amount that you can gift tax-free, then anything above that is a gift. Um, then there's the Gould case from the 30s that people use to argue that no, a legal obligation to support is not a gift. And I've never seen a case that's raised, but people always um, raise it as a possibility where one person is making more money than the other. Um, so when, when, and then as long as it's earned income, we know from the PLRs that, the PLR and the CCA, that um, the higher income earner putting half of their income on the other side of the ledger is not a gift. But if you've done that and then you say, oops, didn't really want to do that, let's call what we've been earning separate property and move it back, then if I had made a million dollars, Marcy reported 500000 of it on her return, I report 500000 on my return, and then we say, you know, the, the relationship is kind of shaky, I think we'll just take all our toys and put them back into our own column, then she's making a gift of $500,000 back to me, using up part of her lifetime exemption from gift tax. 
So you can you can get caught if you don't enter into those agreements, those transmutation agreements, prior to accumulating the funds. So you can always agree to f that future accumulations will be separate or will be, um, but uh, converting past accumulations, you have. Now, similarly, future accumulations of unearned income, if you call that community, you're making partner as well. So my income off of my investment account, if I give half of that to my partner, those community partner PLR CCA will apply to that. That's a gift. California passed its community property statute, but it went into effect two years after it passed, so it gave people time to register or convert or enter into community property agreements or enter into separate property agreements. Washington gave people a little bit of lead time, but not very much time to get educated. IRS is looking at things now. They have uh, what are called the Q&As are on the IRS website. Said, um, there, there were certain things we just don't. So if one member of the couple has student loan interest we didn't know. It doesn't make sense to split it because it really, you know, it, who knows? If you're paying it from the community, it makes sense. Iris came out with a ruling and said, out with QA and and said, oh, for student loan interest, you on the return of the person. Yeah. So I'm the student. I have. And at the end of the paragraph, they say, oh, and by the way, you probably had a gift from partner for half of the student loan. I also did that with education. Uh, educator expenses. Educator expenses, yeah. So they, they are definitely thinking that way. I have not seen them come forward with it. If you had more than 13000 start um, dipping. Good question here in there. You're talking about, um, I understand your question, if you use if you're a separate property and you're in the and you buy something for the community, you like preserve, a house. You preserve your separate property interest. Is that what you're saying? You do. You do. Otherwise, you've made a gift, especially if you buy the house as joint tenants with credit of survivorship. The presumption is you own it 50-50. If you paid for it 100%, you've made a gift partner. Um, and if you pay for it 100%, uh, or if maybe you pay 60%, but it's still presumed to be owned 50-50. And then the IRS gets you again when one of you dies. The person who dies first is presumed to have paid 100% of it, unless you can overcome that presumption. That's a rule that's applicable to unmarried people. Married, that rule doesn't apply. And I wanted to say something else about when you die. So under federal law, when you die, we each have an exemption of $5,200,000 from the state tax to the extent that you haven't used it on gifts during your life. We'll assume you haven't. Um, so if you're married, in a heterosexual marriage, um, there's no uh, estate tax applicable on transfers between one spouse to another at death. That's not true for same-sex couples. Um, same-sex marriage isn't recognized, and that's the basis of the Windsor. Now, Washington passed the marital deduction against our state estate tax 
and that will go into effect January 1st, 2014 for same-sex married couples in Washington. And at that point, if one dies, a transfer to the surviving spouse won't be subject to Washington State estate tax. Oh, did I say transportation agreement? Yes. When I said, I said, well, if there was some sort of an agreement, because there just can't be, and this is general community property principles and for people that aren't aware, I mean, obviously, as Wendy stated before, it becomes an issue mostly in divorce. Um, but we, but the community property presumption here in the state of Washington is very, very, very strong. So what that means is when you get to the end of a relationship, um, and I'm not talking about the same sex or different sex, but, but that the presumption is that everything is community. And the burden is going to be on you, and I think this might get to your question a little bit, the burden is on you if you're asserting something as separate property um, to prove, uh, not by uh, preponderance, but by clear and convincing evidence that it is separate property. Now, there's certain um, things that gives to you um, or your separate property, inheritances are separate property. Um, but people don't really think about this when like, oh, you know, I just, mom died, isn't that sad, but I got $50,000. Um, and then they use a big part of it to pay community bills or they buy, so like, oh, let's buy a cabin, you know, something, not really thinking that they haven't preserved. So it doesn't, there doesn't have to be, I'm making this community property, it's just by the action of doing it. Now, the, the, then the, the issue becomes, can I trace out my separate portion? You might be able to do it just through the documentation. And when I said transmutation agreement, that would be something that would, you know, specifically a written agreement that would say, I'm transmuting this community property to separate or separate to community. Um, but just by the actions of the parties, if you've taken actions that have hopelessly commingled community and separate property, it's deemed community. That's black letter law in Washington. That answer your question. So, um, Marcy, do you have any other um, maybe small bit, tidbits about, for instance, like um, health care benefits what, um, or Social Security income um, or how those are considered tax wise? Someone was asking about right. Social Security income. And this is one of the areas that, where there's nobody. Those the answer on social security. social security, separate property or community property. Five by five, it says we leave state law. There's not a statute in Washington that says property or separate property. Not what you're paying into social security, oh. but what social security pays hey, out when you're collecting. When you're collecting. Yeah. yeah. And so there, there really isn't anything clear, and what, what we have comes from divorce. And when you look at divorce cases, the federal government doesn't allow you to have to tell you, well, take that person's Social Security, getting divorced now, so pay half of it to him. Yeah. And so lots of people say, well, then Social Security is separate. But all that's really saying is, no, you can't split it that way. And so in a court case, you might not be able to split it. But the person who doesn't get the Social Security that might get more of the other assets, right? So anyway, so there's this, this debate. Is it separate property or is it? There's another thing that's a uh, debate. For instance, pensions. Out on a pension and you were in community, you earn the pension and that's community. Not in community for part of the period, and in community, then you have to um, calculate what portion of the pension. But for Social Security, it's not really like you have this type of money over here. Social Security, you just have a right that you're going to be able to collect. And so, anyway, so there's no really good answer on that. And so, what I do is I calculate it. 
both ways for my clients, but not split. We have a long discussion about what we think it is, and it, I, uh, it, my client wants me. Marcy, um, Wendy, I'd like to hear a little bit about what the impacts on estate planning might be. Audience should be aware of hospital visiting rights, um, state benefits. Thoughts on that? Do you have a course? Sure. <laughs> well, we've got, I don't know, 40 minutes or so. Um, so, without, under state law right now, assume if they're in a registered domestic partnership or they're in a marriage, it's true that those statutes provide defaults. They provide a safety net in, um, in some respects for couples who don't have estate planning documents. And the original version of the domestic partnership bill was simply a safety net. It provided 17 different benefits and no burdens, interestingly. So it wasn't like marriage. It was only benefits, just burdens. But those benefits were really very emotional in um, nature and not uh, financial in nature. So they allowed for hospital visitation, making medical decisions, um, Interment, disinterment. Um, th there were some interesting statutes that I'd never read before, actually, about the, the different kinds of decisions. But basically, it was medical decisions on behalf of your partner if you hadn't um, done state planning. And it was really, I think, to help um, people of, of um, minimal means who didn't have state plans. Same rules apply to couples, but what you forget is at the death of the survivor of you, you still need a will to say where your stuff is going to go. You still need a power of attorney because if I designate Marcy to make med medical decisions for me, our attorney, and then Marcy's not able to make this, we need somebody else. So um, my husband can make medical decisions for me, certain decisions for me. Um, but if something happens to him, then in the absence of any documents, you have to go to court and have a guardianship instated. So they did provide a stopgap for people who didn't have any other access to legal documentation. And that's still the case. Um, and there are, for registered domestic partners and for married couples, there are intestacy statutes that talk about where your property goes if you die without a will. But again, if you die, if, if both of you die, and God forbid you have children, but it's only the biological child of one member of the couple and the other member of the couple didn't adopt that child, then um, your property isn't all going to go to that child. The one who didn't adopt their property is going to go to their law, which could be their siblings or their parents. Well, if the presumptions apply, so the, the Uniform Probate Act and the Uniform Parent, parent uh, yeah, the Uniform Probate Code and the Uniform Parentage Act provide certain presumptions. And the presumption in Washington is if you were registered or married and the child was born within 300 days, either during the relationship or within 300 days of the death of either member of the couple, then it's presumed that both members of the couple were the parent. But if you come to the relationship with an already born parent, then in some states there's a presumption if you've acted as a parent for two years of the child's life before the age of like three. An already born parent, that already. Yeah, I'm sorry, <laughs> already born child. Yeah. And act as a parent. Oh, I'm thinking of the uh, the right to disclaim the child.
Right, two out of the first three years of the child's life. So, so yes, in Washington you have to be on the scene and act as a parent, and uh, I think you also have to sign a statement saying that you want to be a parent. No? You just connect. Then, if you don't have either of those situations, you can ask the court to declare you a de facto parent. And to be a de facto parent, that's, that's a, an equitable remedy, but you have to have acted like a parent and uh, assumed both the benefits and the burdens of parent. Right. I would always adopt and not ever rely on de facto parentage unless there's no other option. And no, I've, I've never seen someone, uh, so a descendant, assert de facto parentage as a way to um, it. In a probate action. In a probate. No. I mean, sometimes you can use the equitable remedy of constructive trust that this person intended to be promised, but then you have the debt. I have seen limited occasions where there's been a mis cost. Usually, I mean, I have had two cases lately where somebody wasn't the parent and the child was awarded a portion. But it's usually where there's some other bad fact going on, that if it had been disclosed, it would have been real ugly, so it was much easier to have the estate trust for the kid rather than disclose that the father was running a prostitution ring on It's always lovely when you discover those facts and can use them for the benefit of the child. Oh, God, no, no. Don't put him in That's the worst thing. If you come away knowing anything from this, do not put two returns in one envelope. They'll only look at the top return. Oh. So, so you're, you're filing status for, on your federal return is still going to be... So you allocate that based on days of right. simple mathematical. Yeah. Well, actually, I have a client that got didn't receive a paycheck after. Actually, he received all his community property prior to the marriage. So he actually had no community. They filed joint for the whole year. Does your community property rights extend to you on the, the married, the opposite sex couple? That's, they're not, they're still subject to the same community property law. So if they were going to get divorced the next year, their community property would only start on the 12th. But for purposes of filing their married filing joint tax return, where they're just throwing everything on the same tax return. That just, that's just a function of federal law. Did you have a question? Yeah. 
you have any questions. No, there are three common law marriage states that also have same-sex marriage. Wow, I'm impressed that you know this. <laughs> but none of them are community property states. Common law marriage is not really. For nine. Okay. I don't think any states in the West. No yeah. offense to the other parts of the country. <laughs> Actually, someone. How many? You know, people come in and they present. The file returns that way all the time. We never check, and I don't check the same-sex couples when they're on. Um, there's a thought out there that there are a lot of opposite-sex couples. I'm a married bilingual. Actually, not technically married. And I ask for copies of uh, marriage certificates. And, and you know, part of that's a cultural thing too, because I've had that. Oh, we're married. And it's not because they're lying. It's. I mean, and, and it, I mean, this is what the whole debate's about, right? I mean, in all intents, for all intents and purposes, they are, right? Um, but you know, when we're talking about the IRS, and I recently had a divorce case, which is a high asset case too, where I discovered in the. Discovery period that the parties had filed um, single while they were married. Oh, and, because it's taking taxes. Well, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, they were pretty sophisticated people, um, but the, what the story was well, we got married in Italy, and so they told us that the marriage wasn't recognized in the United States. And I was like, uh, my understanding of Washington divorce laws, if it's recognized by the country that you get married in, Washington recognizes the marriage. So, I guess you got away with it with the IRS, but IRS doesn't check you. Yeah. So. Okay. So Alabama, Colorado, Kansas, Rhode Island, South Carolina, Iowa, Montana, Utah, and Texas in this. Um. Are common laws. Mm -hmm. Well, oh, that's a lot. They may have they may have outlawed it since then. It, it is kind of a dying thing. Yeah, your mom could have been ill. Right, that um, the eight states that have civil union don't allow marriage, that um, marriage being unconstitutional in those states would be struck down and people in this that And then the other one was just that um, they would be able to marry in California. Oh, thank you. I think that's a good one. 
Um, I just wanted, before we moved off estate planning, and I think that we kind of set aside the last half hour for questions or discussion, but Andy, do you have any for same-sex couples, estate uh, planning, Especially estate planning, state service couples, depending on the size of their estate. Council people. Well, I tell same sex couples, and, and I'll tell a story that I um, ended up in this area because um, my best friend died of AIDS in 1989. No, 90. And um, I was handling the probate, and uh, his father had the car keys at the hospital right after he passed away. And his father was upset about putting his part surviving partner's name in the obituary and said, anybody who put a surviving partner's name in the obituary, that his son was not gay, he was a doctor. And then uh, he demanded that I turn over the car keys, and I that, and he punched me in the stomach. And it was um, really, as like I said, you know, the family not wanting to disclose the prostitution ring running out of the basement as a great bargaining chip. Um, having somebody ha have having them punch you in the stomach is really a great bargaining chip, you know. I won't file assault charges if you don't contest the will and you don't, um, you know, claim that his partner had subjected your son to undue influence. Um, so we were able to settle that um, very easily and very quickly. Um, but what I tell clients is there's always an opportunity for um, challenging wills and in unmarried couple situations it goes up a little higher and in same-sex couple situations it goes up even higher so you need to think about bulletproofing your there are lots of ways that no contest clauses are not my favorite thing because in order to make a no contest clause will a work in a will or in the state plan, that's the document that says if anyone contests this will, you get a dollar. You actually have to leave somebody something. And if you really detest this person, um, you, you're not going to be inclined to leave them a meaningful amount of money to make a no contest clause work. So, you know, if somebody doesn't get anything under the will as it's Stated, they have nothing to lose by going out and contesting the will and saying he meant to leave it all to me. So we usually end up with a no contest clause. The first lawsuit is whether or not the no contest clause applies, and the court usually says it doesn't not in this situation, and then you end up in contest anyway. California has just um, made uh, very narrow exceptions for allowing no contest clauses in fact, because there's just so much litigation. Okay. Um, that's one thing you can do. I have clients re-sign their wills frequently. Um, maybe they make a change, maybe they don't, but we calendar for them to come in periodically so that if someone does challenge that will or make noise about challenging it, we can say, go ahead, because we've got nine more in the vault from the nine years prior, and you're going to have to bring one, you know, lawsuit after lawsuit um, in order to, to make this whole plan fall apart. Um, as practitioners, I, uh, I counsel other lawyers to use standard practices in your office so that you don't have to try and remember what happened when a will contest was signed. I don't need to wonder what ha or when a will was signed. I don't need to wonder what happened because uh, Roland York and just um, Professor Price, who's, who's hired uh, from the UW Law School, taught me always do the same thing. Shut the door, ask the same questions, uh, you know, make a note that you notarized the will in your notary log do the same thing every time. So if I'm ever on the witness stand and someone says, what? I can say, I, I don't exactly know, but I can tell you what I do every single time and it doesn't differ. Um, 
And um, some of your assets pass by beneficiary designation, not under your will. So if I have a POD account or I have a brokerage account where I've named a beneficiary or I've got a 401k plan where I've named a beneficiary, uh, you, there are certain things that you can change by will, and I'm not talking about that. I'm just, I'm suggesting that in your will you also say, it's my intent that my 401k plan pass to my partner. Uh, it's my intent that my POD account pass to my partner. So you're just reiterating what you put somewhere else as a belt and suspenders um, in case someone challenges the beneficiary designation or the beneficiary be on guard and you thought that it got sent in but it didn't get sent in and um, that's not that uncommon um, other things don't rely on default provisions in the law don't rely on de facto parentage um, in, a, in a step parent situation try and adopt uh, if you can um, do a will get powers of attorney drafted um, Another thing that people get hung up on is burial and cremation instructions, and I've had this where we've actually had to go to mediation over ashes because um, under the law, if you're not in a registered domestic partnership or a marriage, the right to make decisions law, which could be your parent, not your surviving partner. Um, so we've negotiated. So if you, you can designate someone in writing, it only has to be witnessed by one person, um, not two, um, but I would still recommend two. Uh, you can designate who you want to carry out your wishes as far as uh, funeral, cremation, burial, cryopreservation, preservation, putting your DNA into space. Um, some people do put that in a will, and that's sort of economical. It makes one less document, but I've run into too many situations where people have said, married grandma, or cremated grandma. And then, so grandma's cremated, and then we read the will, and it says that she wants to be buried in the rose garden. Um, and not be cremated. And not be cremated Oops. under any circumstances, <laughs> yeah. Um, that happens from time to time, so that, um, that's even more unseemly. Uh, do, do we have any questions at all? Or? In other words, the yeah, the quality. Yeah. It's it just I guess what he's pointing out is it renames the kind of re, it's a renaming essentially of those years as marriage years rather than so it gives recognition to those years as marriage. Remember that in Washington now, because we have marriage, we're going to phase out domestic partnerships except for opposite sex couples. They can. Partners, but other. Sa no, same or same sex. Over 65. If one of them's over. One of them's over. Oh, over a certain age. But otherwise, if you become a registered domestic partner, it will. Question? They have a, a list of writing about it, which
Yeah, and I wanted to, I'm glad you brought up that because I yeah. meant, meant to mention how you qualify for HOH, which is like the super status, I think, for taxes. So you qualify for head of household. Yeah, you qualify for head of household. Don't have to be a dependent on your tax return. Second thing is that you have to qualify. At exactly 50%. Qualify, and only one can qualify for that. What you need is some. Bucks, which is now my separate property, and now gone over fifty percent. Have to do that before the end of the year. There's no way to cure that. 